saved me. That day I heard you call out my name. You said you loved me, would never leave me. And I never meant to say.
God's people said. <laughs> hey. Amen. Turn around, shake hands, or smile and wave at somebody before you're seated tonight as our pastor comes. Every night, they've been singing the best I've ever heard, and I tell you, we've had some great preaching, haven't we? And last night, I'm telling you, that was tremendous. I really, I really got blessed in every service, but last night was very special to me personally. And, and then the young man got saved last night, and uh, I, I appreciate that. And I've got him some literature tonight, if he's here tonight. Welcome, everybody, to the Jubilee. This is the last night. It went by in a hurry, didn't it? It didn't take but just a jiffy and it was gone and I, and I, I don't know this is football night and a lot of people at the football games but we're glad you're here and we're going to have a good time in the Lord brother Joe will be preaching again a little bit and boy I tell you I hope he preaches as well as he did last night and I know he will I want to pray for those on the prayer list I won't read it off tonight but you just remember them several people and especially not in our church but outside our church are needing prayer tonight and just tell God God knows who they are but they really need prayer tonight. Then remind you of Sunday school, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Everybody plan to be here if you can. And we're looking forward to trying to build the Sunday school on up after COVID. And I tell you that thing, I, I just don't believe you have to fear it anymore. I mean, you, anybody might take it, but don't let it worry you. Don't let it stop you from living. Praise God. Just keep on serving the Lord and let God handle everything. He can. All right, ushers, you come. We're going to receive a love offering for our evangelists. You give tonight whatever the Lord might lay upon your heart. And appreciate these men of God that do such preaching, traveling like they do, staying away from home quite a bit. I remember back when my girls were little, we used to go, I'd get my briefcase out every once in a while in the motel and open it up and look at the pictures of my kids, my girls, and my boy, and my wife, and just tears would fill my eyes. So I know it's not easy all the time to be an evangelist, but God's got to have some of them. And he calls them, and we appreciate these. Brother Jack, lead us in a word of prayer. Our Father, as we come to you again tonight, we come, Lord, with just thanksgiving in our hearts. Lord, we thank you for giving us a beautiful day today. And, Lord, we just ask now that you bless the service in a special way. Bless Brother Sammy and our choir, Lord, the musicians, as they play and sing for your glory. Then, Father, as Brother Joe comes in a few minutes, Lord, we pray that you'd just anoint him from on high. Lord, he's already filled with the Holy Spirit, but just continue to give him what he has to need to preach to us tonight. Let him preach to us as a dying man to a dying world, Lord, and we'll praise you for that. Again, we're going to give you glory and honor for everything you do. And I thank you for what we're about to receive now, for we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
let me let me say thank you to all that participated in this uh, jubilee, Sammy and the musicians, the choir, the good job y'all did every night, and I appreciate it from the depths of my heart. I want to say thank you to our ladies that uh, prepared a meal every night. We just thank God for these uh, ladies. They worked hard, I know, and I've seen them do it, and I just appreciate that so very much. I appreciate our ushers. We got good ushers that do the job. They all, I don't, we don't worry about a thing. They just come right in and take over and do their job, and I thank you for doing that. I want to thank everybody that came uh, during the Jubilee, and uh, it, it's just a blessing to see your members come, but also visitors. We appreciate our visitor, Brother Hale. You've been here about every night except when you went to your church on Wednesday. And we, you, you're a church-going man. You ought to be sanctified by now. <laughs> but, you know, everywhere I go, I, I see you. But I love you, and I appreciate your fellowship. I really do. And, we, and like I said, we have some churches that need prayer tonight. Some of our local churches in our town, be sure and pray that God will undertake for them. And, Brother Joe, I don't know how to thank you, man. I just want you to know we love you. You come on, preach whatever the Lord lays upon your heart, brother. Amen. Thank you, brother. I love y'all. God is good to us. God is good to us. If you love the Lord tonight, say amen. amen. It might be football night, so I think I'll run a field goal for Jesus. I may pass out on the 20-yard line, but you'll have to give me mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Amen. John chapter number 11. Once again, I've enjoyed being at Truth Missionary, and I love you, Pastor, and I thank God for the not only the services we have here, but I appreciate the good fellowship we have uh, during the day and at night after church around the table. And every year, my staff argues uh, who's going to be able to drive me up to truth. They don't like to hear me preach. They just want some of that K macaroni and cheese. Brother, she could sell that stuff. And I don't know if she spits in it or what, but it's good, amen? And we always enjoy the goodness of the Lord. And I appreciate everybody that's prayed for us in these days. And uh, God is good. And I'm glad he's better to us than we are to him. And when I'm not faithful, he is. And I appreciate you praying for our voice. I really do, and our help. And uh, please play for my wife and family. Uh, the devil has his sights set on everybody and everything that's trying to live for God. I believe he knows more about the Bible than some Baptist. I believe he knows that his days are numbered, Brother Sam, and his time is short. And he better enjoy what he's doing tonight because, bless God, his days are coming. And he don't even have the key to his own home. And I'm glad Jesus is Lord. And he's the victor. And he is good. And I appreciate the good blessings of the Lord. Mrs. Arthur sends her love and thanks you for being so good to our family. And uh, I, I, I did like a lot of you guys. I married way above my pay grade. But I tell fellas, if you're going to look at somebody and say, death, do your part, make it good to look at Somebody say amen right there. And I thank the Lord for that. I remember when I was a young preacher, Brother Mays Jackson was picking at me one time. He said, Joe, you need a wife. I said, well, I'm a praying. And he said, what kind are you praying for? I said, I'm praying for Purdy. And he said, son, you don't want one so pretty. Everybody wants. And old Billy Kelly spoke up and said, yeah, but he don't want one so ugly. Nobody would have either. So and the Lord is good. Turn to somebody and tell them, I love you and you need prayer. Amen. John chapter number 11 tonight, and I want you to bear with me. I'm going somewhere, and I don't have time to read this entire chapter, but I'm going to read just several verses. And through the help of the Holy Spirit, we're going to try to tie it together. And God has put something on my heart tonight that I believe will be a help and encouragement to you. John chapter number 11, we break in the chapter in verse number 19. Many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. And then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, 
If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now, before you criticize her, her spirit may not be right, but what she said was right. You can't die around the resurrection and the life. Did you know Jesus never preached a funeral, but he broke a bunch of them up? Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But notice her confidence in the Lord. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. So he gives Martha a special blessing. But there's somebody else that needs something from the Lord, and that's that sister Mary that's still sitting in the house. But Jesus gives her a personal invitation. Tell her the master's come, and he's calling for her. And we come down to verse number 32. Jesus ministers to Mary. And then when Mary was come to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Listen to this. You think they've talked this among themselves? Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But notice in verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And so he had a special blessing for Martha and for Mary. Well, there is somebody else in this little city that needs something from God, and his name is Lazarus. And even though he is dead, Jesus is not going to leave him out either. And notice what he does in verse number 43. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that noticed past it, and he that was dead, came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. He gave Lazarus a special blessing. He gave Martha and Mary a special blessing. But ladies and gentlemen, there's another crowd in this text that needs a blessing. And in reality, they're in worse shape than Martha and Mary and even Lazarus. There is something worse than weeping and crying. There is something worse than physical death and trouble. It's called being lost and undone without God and headed to a devil's hell. And he's going to minister now to the crowd that has the greatest need, those unbelieving Jews. And look what happens in verse number 45. And verse number 45, the Bible said, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did, say this line with me, believed on him. And I'm glad they got what they needed from the Lord. And tonight, this miracle, along with every other miracle Jesus performs, reminds us tonight that for time and eternity that there are no boundaries and borders or limits to what God can do. You remember in John chapter 2 when he performed that first miracle where he turned that water into wine, the Bible said, and this was the beginning. It's almost like the Holy Ghost says, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. And surely there's got to be a limit or boundary to this man by the name of Jesus. Well, he goes on to take a crippled man and make him walk. He goes on to speak healing in one city, and it takes place in another city. He goes on and feeds 5,000 with the five loaves of bread and the two fishes. As we preached last night, he goes on to walk on the water and speak to the wind and the waves. I mean, he goes over there to a woman and sets her free and said, and I believe you've heard this verse around here before, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. There's got to be a limit. There's got to be a boundary. There, there, there's got to be a place where he just can't do anything. And finally, they come to this text, and here's a man that's dead. And he's not just dead, he's graveyard dead. He's not just graveyard dead, he's four days dead. He's not just dead, but he's embalmed externally, wound up like a mummy dead. 
He's not just dead, but according to the words of his own sister, he's stinking dead. He's already stinking. And surely this man has finally met his match. Surely this is a limit and a boundary and a border. But you ain't seen nothing yet. Jesus stands up and says, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, and Jesus loosed him and let him go. And that's as the Holy Ghost is saying, there is no boundaries and borders or limits. And this was just a prelude. This was just an installment to one of the greatest of all miracles found in the 20th chapter. After chapter 19, when he cried, it is finished, and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, and he died, and they put him in Joseph's tomb and sealed it with a stone. Now they know he's met his match. Why, surely there must be a boundary and a border, because the very man that's doing all of these great miracles is dead himself. But I want to say surprise, surprise, surprise. No boundaries, limits, or borders because he arose from the grave and dangled the keys in the face of the devil and said, I'm he that was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I'm glad tonight he is Lord over distance. I'm glad he is Lord over disease. I'm glad he's Lord over darkness. I'm glad he's Lord over distress. I'm glad he's Lord over demons and devils. And he is even Lord over death. Because I come to tell you tonight, there's not a mountain too high. I've come to tell you tonight, there's no valley too deep. I've come to tell you tonight, there is no ocean too wide. I've come to tell you tonight, there is no burden too heavy. I've come to tell you tonight, there's no enemy too great. I've come to tell you tonight, there is no problem too hard. There are no boundaries and borders or limits to what God can do. He's never met his match. He's never even met his equal. Aren't you glad tonight that he's everything that he claimed to be and a whole lot more? And he proves this by meeting the needs in this passage. I broke them down tonight in three categories, Martha and Mary. I call them the distressed, and Jesus meets that need. Then we come to Lazarus. I call him the dead, and Jesus meets his needs. And then I come to the unbelieving Jews, and I call them the doubters, and the disbelievers, but Jesus meets their needs, and he does it with one statement, I am the resurrection and the life. And literally what you have in this text are three unique resurrections. Oh yeah, there are three resurrections in John chapter number 11. That proved to you and I once and forever there are no boundaries and borders or limits to what God can do. And I'm going to give you a warning. I'm about that far to taking me a lap. And if I wasn't so fat and embarrassed myself and give out, I'd run one now. Because I've not come to tell you how great I am. And I've not come to tell you how great religion is, but I've come to tell you, glory to God, there is one that has no boundaries and borders and limits. Whoop. If I'd have known I'd have had this much fun, I'd have joined the church tonight. I'm glad God has no limits. And let's look tonight at these three resurrections that prove it in John 11. Resurrection number one is the most obvious one. I call it the resurrection of life for the dead. Here is where Jesus goes into Bethany and calls a man out of the domain of death and raises him up to new life. I'm glad tonight Job finally got his question answered. You say, what do you mean by that, Brother Job? Or do you remember 
at the graveside of his children. Job looked over at his wife, and together they looked up to heaven. And Job asked his question, if a man die, shall he live again? And Brother Sam, that question reverberates through the rest of the Old Testament. It goes through the Psalms and the Proverbs. It goes through the ecclesiastical preacher. It goes down through the prophets. It goes over the 400 years of prophetic silence. And it goes through the gospel of Matthew and Mark and Luke. But when you come to John and a little sleepy village called Bethany, Jesus says, Job, let me answer your question. If a man die, shall he live again? Boy, the answer is yes, a thousand times yes. And here is how you know, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I've come to tell you tonight that the cemetery is not the end for a child of God. I've come to tell you tonight that the casket is not the end for the child of God. I've come to tell you tonight that the graveyard is not over for your family and mine. I'm glad we have promised to us that one day when Jesus comes that the dead in Christ shall rise first. And Jesus based our resurrection on his own resurrection. He said, because I live, ye too shall live also, because he is the first fruit of them that slept. You know what a first fruit was? On the first day of the harvest, the master of the field would go out and he would pick a sheaf or he would pick a bundle or he would pick a handful and he would bring it back according to the Deuteronomy law and he would wave it before the Lord as a first fruit. And he is saying, hey, there is more where this comes from. A greater picking is right behind me. Oh, I'm glad when Jesus marched out of that grave, he was a sheaf. He was a handful of purpose. He was a first fruit. He was a wave off. And he said, Father, I'm the first to get out of there. But, honey, there's a bigger generation and a more greater resurrection coming behind me. And I'm glad one of these days when the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ is going to rise and our loved ones are going to live again. It's based on his own resurrection. I've come to tell you tonight just as sure as Jesus marched out of that grave some glad morning when this life is over the eastern sky will split and the trump of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the grave will give up their dead and ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Aren't you glad it's a blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's going to come a resurrection because Jesus got up. The rest of us are going to get up. And what a day that is going to be. Someday I want you to go down to Wade Hampton and pull into that big cemetery on the other side of Bob Jones University and just look around at some of them graves. I was over there the other day and I didn't get far till I saw a grave. It had on the front of that grave, J. Harold Smith. I thought, Lord, have mercy. How about that? Over there in that mausoleum, is that uh, four-story high mausoleum? And in that mausoleum on the first little row, three graves up, is the remains of Oliver B. Green. Lord, have mercy. Back on the new part, back over there in the new part, in a double wide grave is Mr. William Churchful Kelly. You know him as Billy, but his legal name was William Churchful. I said, Billy, why did they name you Church Fool? He said, bless God, I was so fat when I got to church. That was a church full of people if it wasn't nobody but me. And man, you say, why is he laying in a double wide grave? Well, you figure it out. He wouldn't fit in a single wide grave. Can I say amen right there? And can you imagine that little piece of can you imagine that little piece of ground? Come resurrection morning when Gabriel blows that trumpet. I believe old uh, brother Smith will get out of that grave and say, neighbor, 
I'm glad I didn't step over the third deadline. I believe old Oliver Green to get up and say, I told you it was by the grace of God. And about that time, here comes Billy Kelly singing, I'll meet you in the morning, and I'll not be a stranger. You say, Brother Joe, you old Baptist, y'all believe all of that because you're trying to escape reality. Really? Well, let me give you some reality. One day, death is coming, and hell is moving, and the elements are going to melt with fervent heat, and hell will open itself to meet sinners at their coming. But I've got an escape from the reality of the fire. I'm going to glory. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to see Jesus. Aren't you glad one day there'll be a resurrection of life for the dead? Our loved ones will live again, and what a day that's going to be. Hallelujah to Jesus. One day we're going to cheat the undertaker because we done got out of here through the upper taker. Praise God, that's our hope, Sam. And that's our anchor of the soul. So there's a resurrection of life for the dead. And oh, there's a second resurrection in John 11. Let me say it like this tonight. There's more than a dead body in Bethany. You see, there are two ladies, they're sisters. They're named Martha and Mary. The Bible tells us in this text that they were not strangers to Jesus. They were not foreigners to Jesus. They were friends of Jesus. In fact, if you follow those two names through the Gospels, you'll find they loved Jesus. They were good to Jesus. They served Jesus. They had their house open to him to come by any time. They let him sleep in a bed. They gave him a table to eat at. They gave him a place to rest himself. They were friends. They were companions. They had served him. They had loved him. And they had honored him. But they had a brother whom they loved. And one day he got sick. And they sent for Jesus. The only thing they knew to do was go ask Jesus for help. But Jesus did not come that first day. Jesus did not come that second day. And before Jesus could get to that little village, their brother doesn't get well. He doesn't get healed. He dies. And they have a funeral. And they embalm him externally like a little mummy. And they lay him in a tomb and put a, put a stone over the door. And I believe in their heart, something shattered. In their heart, something fainted. In their heart, something died. And you hear it come out of their mouth when they meet Jesus on that fourth day. Because both of these girls go to Jesus and they say to him, where have you been? If you'd have been here, this would not have happened. If you'd have been here, we wouldn't be having this wake. If you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. I don't know about you tonight, but I sense a spirit of disappointment in that. I, I sense a spirit of regret in that. And I'm going to just tell you this tonight. If the devil was back then like he is tonight, no wonder, Brother Sam, they had that feeling in their heart that came out of their mouth. Because if the devil was back then like he is tonight, I can just imagine what he said. You say, why? Because I've heard that same diabolical voice say the same damnable, disturbing thoughts, things to me. No doubt the devil said, Martha and Mary, see, I tried to tell you all that stuff you done for Jesus was in vain. All the meals you cooked for Jesus was in vain. All the times you let him stay in your house, it was all in vain. All the times you worshiped him, all the times you worked for him, all the times you served him, look how it's turned out. While if he loved you and appreciated your service, he wouldn't let your brother get sick. Why, if Jesus cared about you and appreciated what you did for him, he wouldn't let your brother die. Why, if Jesus meant to you, or if, he, if you meant to him what you think you mean to him, he'd have come the first day. 
He's late. He's let you down. I've tried to tell you, it doesn't pay to serve him. You see, it's all been in vain. It's all been in vain. You say, preacher, I don't believe the devil tells anybody that. You live long enough, and something's going to come to your house. Something's going to come to your home. Something's going to come to one of your children. Something's going to come into your body. And that old sorry, low-down devil will say, see, I tried to tell you, it didn't pay to go to church. It didn't pay to be faithful. It doesn't pay to give you tithes. Why, there's sinners that have it better than you. There's old drunkards and harlots that have it better than you. Why, people that don't even go to church have it better than you. I want to tell you what to discombobulate you tonight. I want to tell you what to defeat you tonight. You get your eyes on the prosperity of the wicked. You get your eyes on people that hate God and live wicked. And you say, Brother Joe, they got it better than us. Where did you ever read that in the Bible? Bless God, the Bible said of a way of a transgressor's heart. You say, but Brother Joe, they living it up. But you don't understand. This is the best they'll ever have it. This is the best they ever have it. Whatever the devil has showed you they got that you don't have, they're better like the devil. They better enjoy it because this is as good it's going to get for them. Because if they die without Christ, they are burning hell and the pleasures thereof. But just think about it tonight. If your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, this is the worst you'll ever have it. This is the worst it will ever be because, praise God, where I'm going, cancer and divorce and bankruptcy and death cannot enter. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, bless God, the devil's a liar. And he's not just a liar, but he's the daddy rabbit of all the liars. It does pay to serve God. It does pay to raise your family. It does pay to go to church. It does pay to worship God. Hallelujah. It pays. And boy, here they are. The devil's done told them a lie. And they're even questioning the master themselves. And they're brave enough and bold enough to say it to his face. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But resurrection number two. Whew. When Lazarus walks out of that grave, more than a dead body comes back to life. Something comes back to life in the heart. <laughs> Whoop, I'm about to enjoy my own preaching. Something comes back to life in the heart and in the soul of these two sisters. I call it, listen, not only the resurrection of life of the dead, but I call the second one the resurrection of hope and confidence for the distressed. Because Lazarus' physical body had died, but in the heart of Martha and Mary, their hope had died. Their trust had died. Their confidence had died. He didn't come when we asked him. He didn't meet our needs. He didn't solve our problem. He wasn't here when we needed him. Some, their hope and their confidence is shattered. But praise God when Lazarus walks <laughs> When Lazarus walks out of that grave, more than a dead body's come back to life. Hope's living again. Confidence is living again. Assurance is living again. He'll meet your need tonight. You say, oh, Brother Joe, surely there's nobody in this room that's had that thought today. God doesn't love me. And the devil has not told me God doesn't care. And, and that Brother Joe, I don't have no problems. And I don't ever question. And I don't ever doubt. Honey, if you just knew what the devil told half of this crowd today, you'd be amazed because a lot of us in this room have heard this very day the Lord don't love you why you're not a Christian why you don't mean nothing to God why you're wasting your time but you remember this he's lied before he's a lying tonight and he always will lie God does love you God does care for you and he's about to walk in your Bethany and prove to you tonight he loves you and he cares about you and he's going to resurrect your confidence and your hope again. Oh, here's Martha and here's Mary. Let's, let me ask you this tonight. Anybody here, your parent, you have children. 
Well, let me ask you this. Anybody here, you got more than one child. Well, you agree with Brother Joe? They are different. And I don't mean just boy and girl, although some people don't even believe that anymore. But I can just tell you this. I ain't never been attracted to nobody that looked like me. Nor looks like you. <laughs> Woo! They're different. I don't understand it. I don't understand how two kids can have the same mama, have the same daddy, eat the same food, live in the same house, go to the same church. Bam! Different. One's from the sun, one's from the moon. You can have one child just as smart as a tack. And you can have another. Hmm. Dumber than a rock. Brother Sam, every one of your kids is looking and pointing at each other. Now, there's going to be a fight over there. I'm going to have to break up in a little while. But we all know who the best one of that bunch is, and I'll let you take your pick. But if you ask Mama, the boy wins every time. Am I right, girls? You say, how do you know? My Mama loves me, too. You can have two kids, and you can tell one of them, stop it, and they'll stop in their tracks. And you have another one? Hmm. You can yell, frail, beat the tar out of, and they'll say, why? And that gives you another lick or two. Because I said so. Ma'am, they're different. Boy, they're just different. How many believes you're the best that your mama had? Raise your hand and shout glory. Shame on anybody that won't toot their own horn. Say amen right there. All of yours raised her hand at one time. Well, Martha and Mary are their sisters, but they're different. Very, very, very different. In fact, Martha is different than Mary. She has a little more faith, it seems like, because she's got this question, where is he at? If he'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. But, buddy, all she needed was for Jesus to walk in and say, look at me. I'm the resurrection and the life. Your brother's going to live again. She said, that's all I need. Lord, even now. Lord, even now. I know he's dead. I know he's four days dead. I know he stinks. I know it's too late. But, but even now, but, but even now, but even now, can I just tell you, he's in the now world. He's in the now world. Hey, even now. And just like that, Mary was over her, Martha was over her grief. But, Ma, but Mary's different. While Martha's out there getting her blessing, Mary's still stuck in the house. She won't even go out there. She needs a little extra time. She needs a little extra care. She needs something a little extra special. And you know what I love about the Lord? He didn't stop with Martha, but he helped Mary too. And he never got on her or rebuked her or made fun of her. He just met her needs. In fact, he loved her so much, he sent her a message. Tell that girl to get out of the house. Tell her the master's coming. I'm a calling for her. Boy, as soon as she heard the master really did care. Son, she tore out of that house. She ran down that street. She came out to the city limits of Bethany where Jesus was, and she fell down before him, and son, it was over. She coughs it all up. She pulls out the stoppers. She literally pours her heart out. She's weeping at the feet of Jesus. She's letting it go. All of that four days of anguish and disappointment. Son, she's letting her go. She's a weeping and a crying. And just listen to Brother Joe tonight. Tears are not a sign of weakness. Don't ever let nobody tell you that. Tears, Sam, are not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of total dependence upon the Lord. And boy, she's at the feet of Jesus, letting her rip, pouring out them tears. And about that time, she feels something hit the side of her face. She feels it run down her cheeks. She looks down, and it's puddling up on her hands. And she looks up, and to her amazement, not only is she weeping, but now the Lord's going to weeping. 
Not only is she a crying, but the Lord has done gone to crying. And his tears got to mingling with her tears. And her tears got to mingling with his tears. And I've just come to tell you tonight, whoop, when your tears touch the tears of the master, and you and Jesus go to weeping together in harmony, and your tears run together, Psalm 126 is about to come to reality in your life. Oh. Oh, we sow in tears, but we shall reap in joy. Aren't you glad that tears are a language and God understands? And when Mary saw the Lord weeping, she said, he does care. He does care. He does care. It does pay to cook him supper. It does pay to let him have a bed to sleep in. It does pay to weep at his feet. I've just come to tell somebody tonight, don't you believe the devil? He's lied to you. The Lord cares. The Lord is on his way. And that hope and that trust that's weakened in your heart, he's about to let it live again. You can serve him. You can worship him. You can trust him. He's everything that he claimed to be and more. Hallelujah. The resurrection of life for the dead. The resurrection of hope and confidence for the distressed. Oh, but remember now, there's a third resurrection. In fact, I believe, Brother Sam, the greatest of all three is this final one tonight. Because you see, there's more than a dead body in Bethany. There's more than dead hope and trust in the hearts of Martha and Mary. There is a worse death there is a worse tragedy because, you know, Lazarus is dead physically, but, my God, he's done in the bosom of Abraham. Martha and Mary's confidence is dead, but, my God, it's going to live again. But these poor, lost, unbelieving Jews, they're not dead in a tomb they're not dead inside. They're dead in trespasses and in sin. And the worst thing about it, they'll die without God and go to hell. Lazarus may be dead, but he didn't go to hell. Martha and Mary may be weeping, but they're not going to hell. But them unbelieving Jews that don't believe God, they're spiritually dead. They're going to die without God and go to hell. But as Paul Harvey says, page two, here's the rest of the story. Honey, when Lazarus walked out of that tomb, more than a dead body came back to life. When Lazarus came out of that tomb, more than hope and confidence came back to life from the heart of Mary. Oh, but when Lazarus walked out of that tomb, them unbelieving Jews said, he's who he said he was. He's who he said he was. I believe on him. I'll accept him. I'll trust them. And they were born again. They got the greatest resurrection. They were passed from death unto life. And now no matter what happens in their life, they're not going to hell. They'll go to heaven when their time comes because they've been born again, resurrected from a spiritual deadness. Well, glory to God. Woo! There's the resurrection of life for the dead, the resurrection of hope and confidence for the distressed. But there's a resurrection of faith and believing for the doubters. I've never been in a grave and got resurrected yet. I've had faith resurrected a time or two. But I'll tell you, there's one resurrection I got in on 38 plus years ago when I was dead in my sins. And Jesus called my name. And I heard his voice. And I believed on him. I just said it and I'll say it again. I believed on him. I've said it once, I'm going to say it one more time. I believed on him, and he loved me, and he called me, and he saved me, and I'm not going to hell. I can't go to hell. A feller told me to the other day, and I said, I just can't do that. I am glad I've been resurrected from death unto life, and 
Jesus lives in me. Thank God for the resurrection of life, for the death, the resurrection of hope, for the distress, and the resurrection of faith for the doubters. Now you come to the end of chapter 11, and guess what's next? Chapter 12. Even Clemson people ought to understand that. That 12 comes after 11. Why, even Tennessee people understand that. Can I get, even people that live in Dark Corner have got that figured out. But it's more than a number. You know what you got in chapter 12? You got a table. You know what you got in chapter number 12? They're having supper. You know what you got in chapter number 12? They're having a celebration. Well, what do you mean? You see chapter number 11, they're at the tomb, but chapter 12, they're at the table. Chapter number 11, they have the sepulcher, but chapter 12, they're having supper. In chapter number 11, weeping had endured for a night, but chapter number 12, joy had come in the morning. And they're having a supper at Simon the ex-leper's house. And guess who is sitting at that table? Simon the ex-leper and this dude by the name of Lazarus that was dead and is alive. And the center attraction and the honored guest is none other than Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life. Lord, have mercy. You say, what are they celebrating? He ain't a leper no more, and old Lazarus ain't dead no more, and they're celebrating Jesus, who's the one that cured both of them. And right in the middle of their celebration, Mary walks in with that alabaster box. And just said, I just want to tell you one more time. You mean the world to me. And the odor filled the room. And what was a weeping and a wailing became worshiping and praising God. You say, what has that got to do with us? Well, tonight we're in chapter 11 where we hurt, where we cry, where we wonder. But, honey, we're about to get to chapter number 12. Go into the table where we'll celebrate. And I believe in the midst of that celebration, here comes the bride. Not with a lot of bastard box, but with the golden crown. And we'll cast it at the feet of Jesus. And say, Lord, I just want to tell you what you mean to me. I'm not a leper no more because you came by. I'm not an old dead sinner anymore because one day you came by. And aren't you glad tonight he is the meter of all of our needs? And if something in your life has died, I'm glad God can raise it again and have hope living again. He's awesome. He's God. He's our Savior. And there's no boundaries and borders and limits. Let's stand together. Father, we love you tonight. Lord, I'm glad you got Lazarus out of that grave. And Lord, I'm glad you got hope and trust out of Martha and Mary. But Lord, I'm so glad those unbelieving Jews got saved and born again because you met their needs. And Lord, help us to realize tonight our loved ones will live again. And Lord, when the devil lies to us, I'm glad our hope and our confidence will live again. And Lord, there's hope for our lost loved ones and our lost friends. I'm glad you're in the saving business. And one day, Lord, we'll gather in that city and we'll celebrate. We'll celebrate the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Help us to cast all I care upon you, for we love you tonight. In Jesus' name. Brother Sam's going to sing. Maybe there's something tonight. You need to come and say, Lord, I feel dead inside. There's mercy I want to live again. With the Lord. I want hope to live again. I want my family, my dreams to live again. I want to see my loved ones saved. I want to see my family saved. He'll meet your needs. Sing with him. Only trust him. Only what a God. Trust him what a Savior. Trust him now. Oh, he will save you. He 
Yes, he will. He will save you. He will save you now. One more verse. You need a miracle oh, tonight. He's got one for you. Jesus shed he can live again. He can live again. Precious blood, rich blessings to be stored. Yeah. Plunge now into the crimson flow that was. Something's died in your heart. He can snow. make it live again. Sing with him. Only trust him. Oh, only trust him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding our soul this week from the Word of God. Lord, we thank you for the assurance we have in our blessed Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that through our storms, Lord, we have them. Lord, we can just feel what Joe is preaching tonight because many times we've been there, but always you'd come to our rescue. You'd always come and take.